Now, I know you read the title and you thought, Dan's finally lost it, but I'm not sipping the ayahuasca and I didn't find God in some crystal ball. My position here is falsifiable and it's based in science. And, and to be clear, it's not my position. It is an idea that I came up with while I was looking at this paper that was recently published. And I was like, huh. Well, you know, this would explain a lot of the myths that we've seen in different cultures around the world. And so um, strap yourself in here and put your cubenzies down. You're going to need your left brain as much as your right to follow me here. I love this one because it, it's this may or may not be true. It may be complete BS, but it sits perfectly in that spot between what we do know and what we don't. And in this case, it's totally falsifiable. As if they put more effort into this, we could eventually know if this is true or not. So... Strap yourself in. Hi, my name is Dan, and welcome to the Dunky. Myths of humans being able to speak to trees, or more commonly, myths of humans understanding trees speaking to them, is something that we see in lots of different cultures around the world. Matter of fact, Wikipedia even has a page on talking trees, and the list of is pretty extensive. And it's kind of crazy, right? I mean, these accounts are, are pretty effing out there. And for those of you who follow me, you know I'm pretty skeptical. So it's like, why is he talking about this? But we do see a couple of things pop up in most of these accounts. And uh, just bear with me. I promise this is a, there's a payoff here. One legend records Alexander the Great speaking to a tree that had two heads, one man head and one woman head. The male head spoke at dawn, noon, and dusk, and the female head spoke at the corresponding times during the night. Now the plant supposedly predicted Alexander's death by the hands of his own friends, and he needed to have this information translated by some of the locals. And despite their fear of telling him, Alexander was pretty chill about the whole thing and offered to give him a bunch of money and stuff, and they were like, hey, we don't usually do that here, but you're a keen, so yeah, okay. They didn't want to piss Alexander off, so they accepted it according to the tale, it seems. The Yaqui tribe of Arizona and Mexico also have a story about a talking tree. Many centuries ago, the elders of the Yaqui tribe came across the talking tree. Now, this was no ordinary tree. He was very tall and without branches or leaves, so he looked more like a modern telephone pole. Two young Yaqui twins understood what the talking tree was saying, even though the wise men of the tribe could not. Talking tree told the little girls about the coming of Christianity and many other things that have since come to pass. The Yaqui held a beautiful ceremonial deer dance, and miraculously, a real deer came. After the talking tree prophecy, some Yaqui chose to leave the earth and live in enchanted worlds under the mountains and in the oceans. These are the Surum. Other Yaqui stayed to live on the earth. Druids were said to be able to communicate with trees, and shamans and tribes all throughout the world, but basically that was their job, was to communicate with or basically to listen to the calls from nature. That was like what they were tasked to do. Even Moses was said to have received a message from God from a burning bush. Now there are two themes we see repeated in these accounts. One is the trees do the talking and the people do the listening. The other is not everybody can understand, only a handful of people can understand that. And that latter one, that makes a lot of people that are naturally more skeptical, that triggers all of our alarm bells, right? Because here's the thing, I mean, it's not hard to imagine somebody just being like, oh yeah, I can talk to the trees and you, you don't want to make me go hunt or do any of the real work, I'm going to stand here and talk to the trees and bring me some food and yet you know, it's, it's not hard to imagine somebody pulling that kind of a con right but in recent years we've seen a lot of studies with plant communication and it turns out the trees in fact do talk a paper that was accepted in september of 2023 titled green leaf volatile sensory calcium transduction in arabidopsis and it's got authors that i ain't even gonna try to pronounce if you think i did bad on arabidopsis you don't even want to see this but those authors clearly demonstrate in the paper that the plants communicate with each other through volatile organic compounds, or VOCs for short. These are basically chemicals, in this case calcium, that are combined with things like alcohol to make them more chemically reactive. Now research is still in the early stages, and we can't say a whole lot about it, and you know, more mysteries than answers, you know, plants are kind of the pyramids of nature it seems, but... The research is limited to using the VOCs emitted from damage to the plants, and the signals were monitored in real time. These signals were responded to by other plants, and these plants were separated from each other in tubes and stuff so that they were outside stimuli was limited, and so it was almost certainly the VOCs that caused this. So when one of them was being eaten by caterpillars, the other ones would not only respond by releasing their own VOCs, but they would also increase their protections against predation. 
Now VOCs, the chemicals themselves, they're not very exotic. They're pretty basic stuff and they're everywhere. If you could see them, the world around you would look entirely different. It would be like you were walking through a thick, thick fog of chemicals. Whether or not you can detect these signals depends on a few things. The two crucial ones are the receptors that can recognize the calcium in this case, and then the ability to turn that recognition into an electrical impulse, into a neurological impulse you could send to your brain. Basically, you need an ear to hear the signals and a nervous system from ear to brain in order to hear the sound. So if a person had the proper receptors for the VOCs the plants are emitting, and their nervous system had the means to convert that into an electrical impulse, it is hypothetically feasible they could understand or at least receive some portion of the message the plants were sending to each other. Well, I could end it here, but that would just be lazy. Let's look and see what parts of the plant are used to detect calcium in these VOCs and what parts of the plant are used to convert it into an electrical signal and see if humans have anything along those lines. For plants, the paper claims that the stomata is the part most important in the recognition of VOCs, in particular converting them into an electrical signal for, like, for a nervous system. And the stomata is basically the plant's lungs. It's about as close as it has. If you want to get all Bill Nye about it, it's the breathing apparatus of the plant. Humans have stomata. In our lungs, we have small openings that facilitate chemicals passing between different portions of the lungs. Now, it gets pretty complicated and whatnot, but the bottom line is, is that we do have this part of our anatomy. Known as lymphatic stomata, they're present in all mammals. And from the research I did, I wasn't able to find any studies involving humans and the detection of green leaf natural VOCs that the plants use to communicate. Now, obviously, that would be important, right? But on a base level, we do know that we have the same hardware on a base level that's capable of detecting VOCs. Calcium detection is something every skin cell we have can do. It's not like a regular sensation like touch or heat, but it is something that we have, a CASR for short, the calcium sensory receptor, and we absolutely have this in all the cells in our epidermis and a number of cells in our lungs as well. There's so many of them in our lungs that those calcium receptors are used in different kinds of therapy nowadays. Basically, on a fundamental level, we have the hardware to understand the sounds that plants make. But can we understand the language? Do we have the software? Now, this is hard to guess at, but we do have some shamanic traditions to kind of inform us here as far as like what people that think they can talk to trees or hear the trees believe. So maybe there's something to that. Again, we would need more science, more real science to weigh in on this before I could hang my hat on this one way or the other. But it is kind of interesting that the calcium sensors would decrease over time and would require a shaman to have an apprentice just to hear for him. The youngin does the hearing and the older shaman does the interpreting. Uh, it's, again, a lot of speculation here. We need a lot more science, obviously. And this may sound out there to you, but if you're close to my age and 70 odd percent of you at the time you're recording this understand what I'm about to talk about, it, like you get what you've experienced this before you you have a sense that you can't really define that you can't say it's this sense but you interpreted the signals that that sense gave you this, this and nobody really taught you how nobody sat you down and said this sense means it's just over time you experience this sense and you put two and two together older television sets had these gigantic tubes in them and these created a lot of electromagnetic energy Enough that if you walked into a house with a TV on back then, you could feel it. Or you could put your hand near the screen right after turning it off and you could feel the static, a fuzzy feeling, really undefinable, not normal. Not a typical experience, not one of our five senses, but we have the ability to detect it. And we discern it. If you've experienced this enough times, eventually, you, I remember being about 12 years old, walking down the street and could tell that my friend's house had a TV on and I couldn't hear anything and I couldn't see the light, but I could just feel it. And I was probably 30 feet away from it. I'm not the only one that's experienced this. Again, over 70% of you at the time of me recording this in the poll have said such a thing. And I imagine that's going to stay around 70, 75%. Age is a big factor here. So this isn't a well-defined experience. This isn't part of our five senses or anything. But this is something that we absolutely, if, you, if you've been near CRT TVs, you, you know this experience. You almost certainly. But some people don't. Some people don't register this. Some people do. Now my whole idea here could just be a bunch of mummy just, just Nephilim poo. 
But we do have science that lines up with this. We have a lot of mythological traditions that support this kind of thing. And if, if we've got this, like the hardware, and I mean, I would like to see some science weighing in on it. I would love to see. It would be very interesting to me to determine if humans can detect those natural VOCs at all. And if we can, if there's like a higher rate of people being able to detect those in urban areas or, or excuse me, in rural areas as opposed to urban areas, especially like hunter-gatherer people that have been hunter-gatherers for thousands of years as opposed to generations of people that have lived in cities for a few hundred years. That kind of use it or lose it thing may well apply here. And um, it might be something that's completely foreign to urban dwelling folk, but to people that have been living close to the earth and have really never stopped, this is completely natural and normal thing to understand or maybe it's only shamans or maybe maybe dan's just way off in the weeds on this one and you know who knows what i do know is that i really like this one because it is kind of like it's in that happy little middle spot where it's falsifiable so right off the bat it's like what i'm positing here i don't feel like i'm just like oh you know who knows walk away this is very falsifiable but at the same time it's based on some brand new science and it is getting out there but i'm not just like grabbing complete bullshit to put it together i don't know you be the judge of that and i want to give a special thanks to my patrons you guys honestly i say it all the time but you give me a lot of confidence as well knowing that people are actually willing to throw me a few bucks to do this is just like i i really really appreciate it and i hope that this uh, little bit of veering off course isn't too much for everybody i know it's a little bit outside my norm here but those of you who've watched me for a while, you know I love that spot right in the middle, that the duat, as the Egyptians would call that, that, that uh, little chunk of twilight there, the, the twilight zone, the spot in between the reality and the mythology, and you're not really sure which way to lean to, to find the truth or not, and damn it if I don't love those. So I appreciate you watching this one. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and we will see you next time.